us. Okay. Do we have any minutes? I have a half a second here. Okay. Um, half, a second. half a second. Our last meeting was on the 12th of March, and we didn't have a meeting in April because of the national meeting. Uh, and that only meeting minutes I have is our present balance in the bank. The chapter balance was $2,253.19. And we had a total attendance at that meeting of 10 people. Okay. Very good. Those are the meetings. Minutes. Second. So the pressure is pressure for the, uh, uh, over April, we sent the flowers to Mrs. Daniels. She has some health issues, so of uh, expense and an interest. So now we're at 2203.73. And coming up, we got this bunch of pay par, and you're, you're appreciating it. So that's your wife. <laughs> Do I hear a uh, movement that the minutes in the financial report be accepted? Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Good. They are accepted as filed. Thank you very much. <coughs> and now we have a special opportunity. We're going to have an election of officers, uh, the gentlemen who take care of uh, the Treasury Office, and Mr. Alex here, who is taking care of our minutes. Both graciously agreed to stay on board in their capacities. I was forced. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate that and uh, just to keep things on the up and up. I will ask uh, do I hear someone move that we accept? I make a motion to accept the nominee. Uh, Thank you. Do we hear? Uh, do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, all right. You are required to continue to come here, Alex. <laughs> I know you thought you were going to retire and get out of it. I actually enjoy coming here, so don't tell anybody. The last uh, change that I'm going to propose, uh, I have been the chapter chair for two and kind of one quarter terms, and it's time to turn that over to another person. Tim KSBJ has valiantly agreed to uh, step into the running, and I would like to make a motion that we vote on the offer being the new chairman of SB 105. Do I hear a motion? Second. Really good. All in favor? <coughs> Aye. Aye. All opposed? Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Very good. And Congratulations to Fred for the service thank you. for the many years. Thank you, uh, thank you Fred. It was good meeting you six months ago for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ted, your business is now concluded, and now it is time for the star of the show. All of us know this young man, and if you don't know him, you need to get to know him because he can be a good friend or he can. Uh, <laughs> he can be a good friend. <laughs> He's worked for the commission for many, many years. He's been in Houston how many years now? Uh, a bunch. A bunch. Okay. No. Um, the reason I wanted Stephen to come today is to go over what's going on in Washington to the best of his ability to figure it out, because most of us know that Washington is this kind of a thing unto itself, and nobody really knows how they operate. They don't even know it. And just so everybody knows, this is a historic occasion for us. It is our first web stream of the uh, SBE chapter.
when I walk in the door, just make it official, I do show my federal credentials. It says I'm an agent with the Federal Communications Commission. And if I'm really upset with you, then I'll walk in with this showing. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know you're in trouble. <laughs> Again, my name is Stephen Lee, and I'm, I'm one of two guys uh, here in the FCC Enforcement Office. We actually have three guys there, but one's a supervisor, so he doesn't do anything. <laughs> we're, we're the enforcement arm of the, of the FCC. I am in with the enforcement division. We have people in Washington that do certain things, and then the field offices do for certain things. We're kind of known as the eyes and ears in the field because the people in Washington can only know what somebody sends them in a letter or a document or testimony. We can actually go out in the field and find things out, you know. Is this broadcast station really not changing its power at night? Well, we can go out and find that out instead of having Washington, when they get a complaint letter, they write the broadcast and say, are you changing your powers at night? You'd be surprised how many times they get back to you know, response, yes, of course I am. <laughs> now. But anyway, so, so this is what we do. We go out and <clears throat> my responsibilities extend to far greater than just broadcasters. Uh, a lot of these guys I've, I've never met, you know, I apologize, we can't be everywhere at once, but we do land mobile interference, we do safety cases involving police departments, fire departments, the Coast Guard, the FAA, uh, we get involved with other federal agencies to assist them, the, the DEA, um, the FBI, we work with customs quite a bit. So I do a lot of other work other than broadcast, but I do do broadcast work. And the work is anything from a complaint of interference from one station to another, uh, a complaint concerning administrative procedures at one station, and we do do some random inspections. The random inspections is where we get pushed from Washington as to what we're going to do. Obviously, Washington can't control complaints where they come in, so complaints are handled pretty much autonomously by the individual office based on policy for what we're doing with those type of complaints. Uh, we don't handle content complaints in the field. So anything involving indecency or something uh, one of your jocks may have said on the air or anything involving uh, you running of a contest, those complaints are handled in Washington and there's a very specific reason for that. They don't want 25 different field offices have 25 different opinions on whether this contest was run properly or not. They want it to go to a central committee in the Enforcement Bureau in D.C. who can then have a nationwide policy on those types of issues. Obviously, interference issues, uh, whether or not your fence surrounding your AM towers are up or down, that's a local issue, and we handle those type of complaints. Policy kind of drifts back and forth. Sometimes we're asked, and, and there is no hard, fast, you know, you will not do this. But policy kind of changes, it kind of drifts from Washington, almost, I, I tend to refer to it as a fog. It just kind of moves in, and you know which way it's blowing. And sometimes we're asked, you know, hey, leave the broadcasters alone unless you get a complaint. You know, don't do very many random things. And sometimes we're asked, well, you know, we've got some problems we don't think the EAS system is, is as robust as it should be. Let's go out and do some EAS inspections. So we'll come out, we'll knock on doors, we'll do an EAS inspection, and we'll leave you alone. Um, pretty much gone are the days when we do full broadcast inspections. I used to just randomly pick a station. I need to do three stations in Houston. I'll do these, these three. And I go knock on the door, introduce myself, and say, I'm here to do a broadcast inspection today on your station. And we go through everything public file, your posting of your license, your transmitter control, your power, your modulation, uh, your public inspection file. I think I said that. Um, but there are certain things that are still critical. Anything involving safety, we're likely at any time to come out and look at. This includes tower lights, uh, your EAS. If you're an AM broadcast station, uh, we want to make sure your fences are, are 
where they'll keep particularly children away from your towers uh, or anybody, basically, away from your towers. A good fence that's erected, secure, and locked. Um, the other thing that's still critical, and this is not by the field office choice, this is a Washington mandate, is your public inspection file. Um, I mean, I know I've got broadcasters that tell me year after year after year, nobody except an FCC inspector has ever looked at our public inspection file. Well, then keep it in shape for that next time that FCC inspector comes in. Because when he comes in, he's going to want to see that public inspection file. Um, probably the number one thing that's tripping up broadcasters these days is the issues and programmings list. I mean, come on, guys. It's not that difficult. You run certain programs to put in this list. You write down the program, what day it was run, how long it was, and what the subject was. You put that in a file. It's not that difficult. Come on, get with the program. I know it's a burden, but it's something that the, that the, broad, that the media bureau requires our broadcasters to do, and we expect y'all to do it. Um, we're not so concerned about it in the field, but then there are certain things we can't get away with letting you slide on. And that's probably one of them. We want to see that your license is posted. And, and these are things that we do because we want, to, we want to make sure that broadcasters are responsive to the public. And that's, that's the key right there. Is if your public inspection file isn't available, if you're not willing to talk to a member of the public about a complaint they have against your station, you're not being responsive to the public and under the Communications Act and under the way the Media Bureau and the FCC in general looks at it, that is your responsibility. Um, fencing. The most place that you're likely to get a fine from the FCC is, is as I mentioned, the earlier the safety things. If your tower lights are out and you don't know it. Um, <coughs> Nearly everybody now has gone to some type of alarm system instead of a daily observation of your lights. And that's fine, there's no problem with that. But don't remember that, I mean, don't forget that that alarm system's gotta be checked out occasionally too. <coughs> don't expect it just to, you know, run on itself without checking those things out. And beyond anything else I can say is document. No big deal, you had a light out last week and you got it fixed, but document it. No big deal if I show up at your station and your EAS system isn't functioning that day as long as you've documented it. Write down in the rules. Check your EAA system once a week. Have your chief operator make sure that you've sent that test, that you've received that test, and document it. If he comes back and for the next two weeks you haven't received a test and there's nothing in the law that says anything, well, I'm probably going to zap you for that. Now, if you say in there, yeah, we're having trouble with this, we've pulled out the equipment, it's been shipped off to the manufacturer for testing, or it's being bench tested, or whatever, and there's something in the rules, you've got 60 days. Put that in your log. Beyond 60 days, get, get a waiver, get permission from the Mass Media Bureau to not have that equipment operating. Because quite frankly, I don't care if it's documented. That's just the way the rules are written. You document it, I'm okay with it. And that goes for most things. If your tower is in need of painting and I show up that day and I see that three weeks ago you decided your tower needed painted and you've got a bid and here's the bid and you're looking at the second bid and you're about to contract out to get somebody to get out to get your tower painting, I'm gonna let it go. I'm not gonna worry about it. If I show up there and obviously that tower has been fading for the past two and a half years and I say, you know, your tower's in bad shape. And you say, well, yeah, it probably is. All right, you're in trouble. Do something before I get there. And it's quite likely I'm going to overlook it because it's not. We're interested in seeing that things are maintained that affect public safety. And then we're interested after that in seeing things that affect that your responsiveness to the public. And then we're worried about the little stuff after that. Is your license posted? What does it mean to have it posted? Is it physically on a wall? I don't care. It's in a book. The thing is, if I ask to see your license, I want you to grab it and say, okay, here's my license. 
It's in a book. That's fine with me. If it's sitting on the wall in the studio, that's fine with me. We're not, we're not that picky on details. Um, and, and this is something that, you know, when I joined the commission some 29 years ago, we were a bit more picky then. I mean, we had a four-page inspection thing to fill out when we showed up. And we looked at this and budget here, and we've gotten away from that. We're, we're more a friendlier FCC, as I might say. Um, and, and part of that is not really anything conscious that the agency officially has done. It's something that more or less, as, as the inspectors have grown into their jobs, we've kind of done ourselves. So, as Fred was saying, I'm a nice guy, get to know me. <laughs> Does anybody have any specific questions on um, any burning issue you've had that you haven't had answered? Ever. What are they doing? <clears throat> yes, sir. Black hat. Um, <clears throat> Okay. What can we do about that? Complain. <laughs> I mean, basically, uh, there is a, there is a lot of equipment that's getting into the U.S. that shouldn't be getting into the U.S. Uh, and the commission nationwide has been working more and more with customs to try to prevent it. But it, it's it's very difficult. There are a lot of of uh, two gig wireless cameras that are being sold to not only businesses but but uh, residences and they don't meet the tech technical standards they should uh, on those type issues it's almost something that's going to have to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis and I realize that's tough for you guys because you go out and you set up on this site and there's interference there and then you're gone in half a day or two days um, so technically the interference is gone for you but if it is something that you can tell me you know I'm getting I'm set up on this frequency and I'm hearing something I shouldn't be hearing in this area, we can come out and look at it. Um, can't say we can find it or find it immediately for you, but in, in a lot of cases, you know, we'll do what we can. Um, but you, you bring up another point that, that I meant to mention early on. There are two guys in the, in the Houston office. We cover from basically a line starting at uh, Nacogdoches, going through Austin, down to Del Rio, down to the valley. So we don't get to a lot of places. One of the complaints I hear from people is that, well, gee, this station's modulation has been horrible for the past year and a half. Where have you guys been? Well, I don't drive around listening to stations to figure out what their modulation level is. I don't have the time. The only way we know that there's a problem is if somebody calls us and lets us know. We, we simply, we don't have the people or resources in the field anymore. Our field office down, we have 100, 104 engineers like myself nationwide. And we just don't have the manpower to do routine monitoring. Like I said, we, we do very few routine broadcast inspections anymore. We're mostly complaint generated, complaint oriented, uh, complaint driven. And so if, if there's a broadcaster staying on daytime or AM staying on at night, I won't know about it unless somebody tells me. If, uh, if, if you know a station that has closed his main studio and hasn't had it open for the past six months, I won't know about it. You gotta tell me. We do, we are interested in resolving these problems and investigating them, but we have to find out about them. And the only way to do is if somebody complains. Um, traditionally, um, I've been involved with SB on and off for all the years I've worked with the uh, with the commission. 
both here in Houston and when I was in New Orleans office working there. And I know that it's kind of the unwritten rule. You guys really don't like to tattle on one another. And well, guys, we, we got to find out somewhere. You know, if you don't want your name known, drop an anonymous letter and in, in mail to my office. Um, but if, if we don't find out that, you know, XYZ station's got a problem from somebody, then we'll never know about it. Um, tower lights, you know, I, I get a call from from somebody that lives near a tower, some just j joke you public that lives near a tower, you know, these tower lights have been out for years. I said, well, you know, have, has, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll come look at them. And sure enough, I show up and the tower lights are out and find out the tower's been abandoned. You know, the, the whoever the land mobile, the broadcaster, whoever tower it belonged to is out of business and gone and the tower has no power to it, much less, you know, the fact whether or not the lights would actually work if it had power to it. But we just, we don't have time, you know, but we, we do look for these things when we're out but there's not much time to really investigate them unless we have a complaint. I know what Tom's talking about is like here in Houston, two gigs pretty much like a citizen's band already. Yeah. Uh, everybody's yeah. rolling on there and you don't know who's going to pop up where. And, and I know that's getting to be, a, and especially in major markets like this, it's beginning to be a bigger and bigger problem. Uh, what equipment it is, I mean, I've seen some two gig cameras operating in places that have done that. Uh, most of them right outside of the BAS right. channels that we use, but but we're, we're we're seeing more and more of that in the major markets like this, and, and I think that's probably something that it's at some point either your your group's going to have to address it or look into it, and then report to Washington and let them address it up there right. as to how we. Well, and and the other thing is is don't. Uh, Don't be shy. It's an organization of making a complaint to Washington. Um, because it, I don't know why, but it, it's always been the, the way in the commission. If I see a problem and I write a report on it and I say, hey, this is a growing trend I see with this problem. This is going to be a major problem. And I send it up to Washington. It's like, eh, okay. But if SBE sends a letter up to Washington saying, hey, this is a problem. We see this as a, it's a major problem growing. Oh, I'll get information come back down to me that says, you know, this is a problem, SBA says. We've got to address this. Get out and do something about it. They don't, it's not that they don't trust me. They do. But like most federal agencies, we're interested in responding to outside complaints. And Congress has mandated us to do that. So it's always good to get an outside complaint, um, send it up through national submitted as a local chapter that it's a Houston market problem. Uh, doesn't really matter, but it would it would put some push behind it if it came from an outside source rather than me saying, you know, hey, I hear from broadcasters and I've checked it out. And yeah, there just tends to be a problem here. It would help if, if it came from an outside source. The uh, public files for television are now required to be online, correct? Certain portions of them Certain. are required to be online. What when is that going to happen for radio? The last I saw anything about that, they hadn't decided. They were talking about making it 2014. But it, I, didn't, I didn't see anything in concrete rules that says, yes, there is a 2014 date. The notice of proposed rulemaking was talking about it sometime June 1st, I think, 2014. But that, you know... The commission is notoriously known for setting a hard, fast deadline, coming right up to it, and then extending it by six months. Oh, like, so, like the, the, uh, the <laughs> national <laughs> EAS test? Yes. Is there, is there any further word on whether they're going to do another one or? Oh, God, we hope not. Well, it was a according, according to what I read, it was a success. They found all the broken pieces. Yeah. All over the place. <laughs> Let's pick them. Get, getting back to um, the issue with the uh, on the tower that's been abandoned, how do you how do you guys how's that resolved? Well, Dude. we we go back to it. It really gets difficult because we get a lot of lawyers involved, basically, uh, both 
commission lawyers and Department of Justice lawyers. Um, but basically, we have to go back to who's responsible for the tower. If the entity is truly bankrupt, gone, unable to, to, to locate them, then it, it reverts back to whoever has legal possession of it. And that varies from state to state. In Texas, it's pretty simple. The tower's on your property, you're responsible for it as the property owner. And so we would start with demand letters of the property owner to either relight the tower to avoid the, the safety hazard for air navigation or to have it dismantled. And it, it can come down, it can get pretty tough because dismantling a tower is not cheap. Yeah. And if you're pretty much an indigent property owner or say you're a retired property owner with small income, you don't have the money to have that tower dismantled. And it, it can come down to going before a federal judge and getting a court order. And then it's either light the tower, pay the light bill, or uh, take a hack on the guy wires. That's right. <laughs> and that's when it that's when it gets creative. Is okay, you know, the guy's decided he, he you know you can't get blood out of a turnip. We can't, you know, demand this guy who makes, you know, two thousand a month on a pension to relight, you know, pay a fourteen thousand dollar bill to have the tower relit. So okay, well, how do we get it torn down then, you know? And we've done lots of creative stuff. We've gone to, to sheet metal recycling places, uh, gone to amateur radio operators. You know, you want to come in and dismantle this tower? Good we'll give it to you. Uh, but, you know, basically uh, at that point, it, we do have to get court orders and it can get pretty nasty. Yes? Speaking of towers, is a color chart still part of your inspection process for paint? It can be. We still have them, we, we keep them current. Um, we've, we've found an easier method that's so far been accepted in the courts. Uh, and that's basically, uh, I'm give away a trade secret here, so everybody get your notepads out. Basically what we do in the field is we'll go out to a tower that we're concerned about the paint on. We get ourselves approximately a quarter of a mile away from the tower. Um, as best we can, we'll make sure the sun's at our back. So that we're seeing the tower, not looking through the tower at the sun. And the key is, not that this is subjective at all. The calibrated eyeball. Yeah. The calibrated the eyeball. eyeball. <laughs> Can you clearly distinguish the bands? Yeah. Orange, white, yeah. orange, white, yeah. orange, white. If they're, yeah, they're there. It's good. If it's like, well, okay, yeah, that's where the orange stops and the white starts. That's where the next orange band starts. That's no good. We, we want to be able to just, yeah, yeah, they're the bands. Clearly distinguish the bands. And so that's basically what we do. And if, if you can do that at a quarter of a mile, if there's a question at a quarter of a mile whether or not you can see that paint or not, it probably needs to be repainted. The, the problem with the, the, the paint, and again, it's a, it's, a, it's a subjective nature of the way the rules are written. Uh, the rules technically require you to clean and repaint a tower as often as necessary to maintain good visibility. Okay, so there's nothing subjective about the way that rule is written. I mean, your tower lights are required to be on after dusk until dawn. That's pretty clear. You can go up and show up at 10 o'clock at night and the lights aren't on, you violated that rule. So that, that's clear question is, when I show up and I, in the daytime and I look at that paint, it's like, eh, well, you know, it's probably good another three months. I'll come back in three months. Well, you don't really know. Um, obviously, if we get, you know, close up to the tower where we can inspect it and touch it, we can see how much of the paint has, has flaked off, how faded it is, and that's where you can put a color chart against it. But we don't, we don't withhold a sanction as such until we use the color chart. If we're at a quarter mile and we can't distinguish it, can't clearly distinguish the bands, then we consider it in violation. Um, that's the other, the other thing that people panic over. Oh my God, the FCC is here, I'm gonna get a violation. Well, yeah, you might. But the violation may be one of three things. It may be me telling you while I'm there, hey, I don't like the organization of your public file, do it this way. 
That's a violation. So we could consider an oral warning. You could get a written warning that says the FCC was here and we don't like the way your public file is organized. Redo it. Oh, I guess the poor thing. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you get an oral warning or you can get a written warning. If it's something that is, there's clearly no question on, it's not just something the inspector doesn't like because it's his personal opinion, but it's something there's no question on. You did not have a copy of your station license application, latest application in your public inspection file. You're going to get what's called a notice of violation. This is a big official looking document now. It used to be on local office letterhead. It used to be pretty simple and Washington's taken it. The lawyers have taken it and turned it into this some legal document now. But that aside, it, it's still a pretty simple document. Basically it says we showed up, we inspected you, we found this violation. And we'll quote the rule and then we'll tell you what we found. Public inspection files contain all these items, blah, 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 blah. That's time of inspection. You were missing the contour map. And it tells you you've got to write us back within 20 days and tell us that you've corrected this violation. If you do that, the case is closed and we're done. Um, then if, if it's a serious violation, I show up and your AM tower fence is not only unlocked, but half the, half the fence is now down on the ground. You're going to get a violation notice, just like that one, that says we found this violation. And attached in there is going to be some language that say the issuance of this notice does not preclude the commission from issuing you a forfeiture if necessary or if needed or however the authorities have described that. Basically what that means is you've still got that 20 days to write us back and tell us you fixed it. And then we're going to decide basically whether or not to go ahead and issue you a fine. And if it's a safety issue, you liable to get a fine. If it's something so flagrantly in violation. Like there's no fence. <laughs> like there's no fence, and it's obvious there hasn't been a fence. Um, I, I've been out to towers before. Um, in fact, I really should plug in my photographs, show you some of these. What, what do you do when you have when you have a neighbor that says the fence is on their property and they take your fence down? You probably have to deal with your neighbor in local court. Because <laughs> we're not going to use that as an excuse. Move the fence closer to your tower <laughs> on your property. Well, the EPA was the one that put it up. Uh, okay. <laughs> but um, in, in worst case scenario, you're going to get what, what we refer to as a notice of apparent liability. And that's typically a fine. Um, what it means is we're not saying that you're getting the fine right off the bat, but you are. <laughs> it, you can count on it. It says for this particular violation, this was a safety issue, you violated it, it's obviously you violated it for a long period of time, and for this type of violation, we administratively issue you a fine of $10,000. Then you have two options at that point. You can pay it, or you can write us back to say, well, here are the mitigating circumstances, you know, here's the story behind the story, and we think it should be reduced, or we think it should be canceled. Uh, we think it shouldn't apply to our station because we're such a goody-goody station. Yeah. We're a non-profit. We're a religious station. We're whatever. Uh, we're poor. Then we'll write poor. you back after that and say, okay, we've considered all these factors to pay you $10,000. <laughs> At that point, it becomes a, what, what we refer to as a forfeiture, and you get a forfeiture order. And then it's still an it's, it's administrative thing. It's not a criminal thing. So what will happen at that point is you either decide to pay it, which most broadcasters do because they don't want their licenses tied up while one of these is pending. But you can take us to court. Well, actually, you don't have to worry about taking us to court. We'll, we'll take, take you to court. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not paid, then it's considered a debt to the federal government. And then we file to sue to recover the debt in federal court. So that's how those, those are. Feels like it's important. Yes, yes, yes. And, and this is often the case that mm. with issues that come before federal judges, we're relatively skinny any stuff. It's just, you know, we, our, our $5,000 fine or our $10,000 fine. Eh, yeah. You know, you, know you, you, got, you got a drug deal here, you know, a drug dealer that's, you know, out on a million dollar bail that's 
needs to be tried. Well, mm. he's obviously going to get priority in the federal court system. So we have to first convince the local district attorney to go ahead and take it before the judge. <laughs> and depending upon how important the case is to us, depends on how hard our lawyers push on that. But you still have, a, uh, you can still get the licensee or hold up their license and such. Their license can be held up. We cannot, we cannot refuse to renew the license based on an unpaid forfeiture. But you can delay it. But there can be all kinds of trouble with getting it renewed in the meantime. And, and especially like sold at some point, transferred. Oh, it, yeah, yeah. It, 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 I, guarantee, I guarantee you, I guarantee a license, a, a well, license that's got pending forfeiture on it will not be transferred in a sale. In fact, often the guy wanting to buy the station will pay the fine in order to get that settled before he tries to go do the transfer. The latest on the, the EAS uh, hot balls. Uh, the, the cap? The, the cap, yeah, the cap component. <laughs> the latest is it's supposed to be at your station installed and operational. And we have been asked to check on stations as we can. Um, to do what we call these focused or mini inspections where we just go in and we look at your EAS or we look at your public file. Uh, and they're, they're doing some of those. We haven't, we haven't done very many here locally. Uh, and I say locally in the Houston market. We've done a few outside the Houston market um, out of the Houston office. Do you know if they're going to try to do another national test or that or that last one? Haven't, kind of haven't heard one. anything on doing one of those. I, I don't think... I mean, there was good information that came from the last one, but organizational-wise, getting it to go was a real headache at the commission. And particularly now that FEMA's as heavily involved as they are with the CAP stuff, I just don't know that the commission wants to take on the <coughs> headache of trying to organize and get one going again. So I haven't heard anything about any, any efforts to put another one together. They're, they're still negotiating, NAB and the FCC are still negotiating on how they're going to do the auction and all that. So, so you're talking about this, this, the, the Spectrum auction? Yeah. The, yeah. They're still planning on doing it for the, for the TV broadcast Spectrum, yes. They're planning on doing it, but the question is, is how and when. And how are they going to resolve issues uh, with Canada and Mexico? Those have to be brought They're in the still region. working on it. That's all I can tell you. I really don't know. I mean, oftentimes the field doesn't know something that's being proposed. We don't, we don't get updates on how it's going in the process. We know what's going on um, simply because we, we, you know, we read the same Tom <coughs> Daly output that you do from the commission. But we don't always, you know, and, until something is done and they say, okay, here is the new way it's going to work and here's the new rules. Um, I mean, this applies to changes in rules where, we, where we're involved directly having to go out and inspect. We often just don't know about it until it's set in concrete and done. And then they give us our marching orders say, okay, here's the new rule, go out and do this. Yes? Going back to towers and fencing, what about uh, tower signage that may not be visible readily because of the hyperfencing that's used? We prefer you put multiple signs. There is nothing in the rules that requires you to put multiple signs. But the, the question is, is do you want me to walk up there and see it and check it off and say, yeah, it's good, and leave? <laughs> or do you want me to stick around and start nosing around as to why I can't see the signage that you have there that I just can't see? Um, and that's basically what I tell the tower companies. And they say, okay, we'll put an extra one at the gate. Yeah, I, I prefer you see it at the gate yeah, as opposed to at the tower. <laughs> Not that I'm doing anything wrong, no, no, sure. but I wouldn't want, you're so busy, I wouldn't I, want you to I, have to take that extra time. We appreciate that. <laughs> we we so, do appreciate uh, that. Wasn't there a notice or uh, with a translator here <coughs> that proper signage? Yes, and that signage is different than your standard tower signage. When we're referring to towers, the tower owner, which often, you know, usually with a broadcaster, it's the broadcaster. 
uh, well, always with the FM, AM broadcaster, it's, it, you know, I've never seen a, a, a rental tower company own the AM towers. But the owner is required to post the antenna structure registration number. That's the seven-digit number that the FCC assigns that identifies that unique tower. And it's required to be posted in signage. Um, the rule says at the base of the tower structure. Well, that, you know, for some people that means putting in the, you know, on a piece of concrete right there on the ground. That's at the base. Well, the purpose of the rule is so that if your tower lights are out, Somebody can look at that tower and say, those tower lights are out. What's that number? Ah, oh, there's that number. It's 1205564. And they can call the FCC or they can call the, AA, the FAA. They can say, you know, on this tower number, the lights are out. The FAA can issue a warning to pilots immediately. Or if they call us, we call the FAA and say, you issue a warning on this tower. It, it's, it's in the FAA's database as well as the FCC's database. So that they know it's a 550-foot tower. It stands at the corner of these two roads, and it's supposed to have, you know, a strobe light at the top, strobe light in the middle, and it doesn't. So a warning goes out immediately to the pilots. The translator issue is when you install a translator, an FM translator station, there's a separate rule in the translator rules that requires you to post certain information about that license at the transmitter site so it's visible to a person standing on the ground at the transmitter site. It's a bit more detailed than the other, the other rule. It involves your call sign, uh, who the licensee is, uh, the address of the licensee, and a telephone number to get a hold of somebody in the licensee about the records for that translator station. Part of this rule has to do with the way applications are filed for translator stations and the fact that you, you can't file a translator license application that's going to have a certain overlap with another translator. And so if you're a, an applicant, you've got to be able to identify translator stations in, your, in the area that you're trying to, to apply for a new one. And this is one way to do it, is, is to have these at the base of the transfer tower. And yes, we, we, we received an anonymous complaint um, that there were all of these translator stations in Houston that weren't abiding by various rules including this one. Um, it, was, it was a, what we call the catch-all complaint. They're doing this, and they're doing that, and they're doing this, and they're doing that. Okay, you know, it's covered all bases. Anyway, so I ran out, I said, okay, this would be easy. And I picked out three stations, and I ran out three for three, did not have the signage. So, well, notice the violations went out, the in each case, they've corrected the situation, wrote me back, told them that they've corrected, and I've closed the case on it. Did, uh, is that another case where you prefer it to have a secondary sign on the property that the limits of the property fence? Or? It would help, yes. Um, obviously, um, I'm not granted authority to trespass. Um, that being said, the trespass laws in the state of Texas are a bit nebulous. <laughs> and unless you're asked to leave, you're technically not transmitted, trespassing. So I will often climb a gate and walk into a tower site to look for the signs. Uh, and technically, if you've got one there, it's in compliance, even though I can't see it. But yeah, it would help if you had a secondary sign, just like we tell the people about the antenna structure numbers. It would help if you've got, if you've got a gate that's going to block the public. And you do have one at the tower site, but it can't be seen. So you issue notums for if you see a tower light, obviously, and the yes, we, call we, flight we, service. Yes, we, 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 we will call notum. the flight service if we if we see an unlit tower to make sure that either a notice has been filed or we will file one with the FAA. Can I see another hand somewhere? Just, just to recap on the translator signage issue, the sign has to be outside. It has to be in such a place that it can be read without anybody having to go in the building. Without anybody having to go in the building. The rule doesn't say it, but it implies that it can be read by a member of the general public. And we still debate internally what that means, whether or not that truly means it. And, and the reason I say that is we currently have a translator. Don't want to give it away, I guess. Well, yeah, yeah. doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
we currently have a translator that I'm interested in as to whether or not they have signage where a person standing on the ground can see it. And the reason I'm interested in it is because the translator is on top of a building. Yep. So the building is, the way the rule is written, the rule says that you have to have signage at the base of the supporting structure of the translator antenna. <laughs> so, if it's a building, where are they going to put it on the building? Yeah. And this was discussed with my two immediate supervisors on a conference call a couple of weeks ago. And the big boss said, well, we got to really consider the, the reason for that rule is, is to be able to get the information about the translator. And if it's a building and they've got a lobby and you walk in and you ask about the translator and they have that information, he said, I'm going to consider that good. I said, okay, that's fine with me. Instead of requiring an actual physical sign somewhere in downtown Houston, on the side of a building. <laughs> and we have a translator that's in that exact situation you're talking about. And it's just, we can't put sign in the building. You know, it may be the one you're looking at. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> but again, it, it's a matter of, of what was the intent of the rule when they wrote the rule. And the intent was that somebody would be able to get information about the translator without too much difficulty. Uh, and so, you know, like yeah, if you I walked into that. the building and they had a lobby or a security guard or a, a leasing management on site that could tell you, yes, this is the translator, contact this guy about the information, okay. then that would probably that satisfy would, the rule. That's what we can do. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, well, I was curious, you know, so whether or not we're going to see these little signs on the side of buildings. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, well, the building owner would let you stick a sign on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, well, they probably yeah, wouldn't just charge you more rent. Yeah, just charge yeah. more rent. <laughs> yeah. Yes. How many stations have you come across that still have not installed new EAS? Nationwide, it's probably been running almost 10%. Hmm. Wow. It hadn't, been, it hadn't been real bad, but it's, it's been higher than we thought it would be when we started doing these, these little focused inspections. And I guess that dovetails into the next question. How many of you run across that have nothing? <laughs> you still occasionally hit those. Um, and it, it it's more than just, I mean, you know, based on past history, what, what you typically think of is, is, you know, the station up here in Podunk that, you know, it's, it's barely getting by on shoestrings. But he's the guy that's got it. Because he can't afford to fight. Because, well, yeah, that's basically it. I mean, he's been told you have to have it, and he's managed to survive and keep this station on the air all these years by having what he has to have. But some of your more corporate-based owners haven't got the word yet. We're looking at it. <laughs> and fines are coming out. We've issued, probably in the past six months, we've probably issued oh, six fines. Yeah, probably one a month. Um, nationwide, and it's eight thousand dollar fine for not having EAS equipment, and it's pretty close to an eight thousand dollar fine for ha not having cap equipment. It's pretty close to an eight thousand dollar fine for <coughs> not monitoring your two sources. In fact, they pretty much consider an EAS violation eight thousand mm dollars. -hmm. So just you know, if you're worried about for, not for spending the money. Um, just keep that in mind. It's eight thousand dollars. And, and how, how do you determine uh, occurrences on that? Like if if you haven't had an EAS box in in ten years, like I've read some of these. Well, <laughs> a lot of that has to do with whether or not the guy's going to be honest with you. And if the guy, yeah, un unfortunately, the guy's cutting his own throat. But when the guy shows up and he says, yeah, he said, I've worked here for five and a half years and said, there's never been an EAS equipment here. Yeah. Well, that, believe me, that's going in the forfeiture order. Um, in some cases, um, we can increase the base amount. All fines have a base amount. We're required under court orders to do that. So we've established base amounts for rule violations for our forfeiture. And they start at the highest, um, lack of commander with, co candor with the commission. If you lie to the commission in writing, 
He's not good. That's ten thousand dollars. Um, and For worse each than that, you can lose your license over that. <coughs> then we go to the safety issues. Uh, tower painting and lighting. Tower painting and lighting is a ten thousand dollar fine. Then it starts going down from there. Um, EAS violation. That's still safety, so it's four thousand. Uh, Eight thousand. Uh, lack of tower fencing is seven thousand. Um, it goes down from there. Um, not changing modes at nights, like four or five thousand. Failing to file documents, that's three thousand. And so the fines go down based on a base amount. But for any given fine, we're, we, we're look, we have to look at certain things under, under the Communications Act. We have to look at the licensee culpability. We have to look at the egregiousness of the violation. Uh, we have to look at whether or not it affects a lot of people. Uh, whether or not there's a safety aspect to it. And the fine can be adjusted up or down based on that. So we may issue you a, an $8,000 forfeiture for not having your EAS system compliant, but we're going to reduce it by four because all that was matter, all that was missing was you were failing to monitor one source. You had one source monitored, but you weren't monitoring your second source. So we're going to, we're going to propose an $8,000 <coughs> fine, but in the same document, we're going to reduce it to four based on the fact everything else was working. And so the fine would come to you as a proposed four thousand dollar fine. You get to write back, and we get to decide what you're actually going to pay. Or if you have no EAS equipment at all, you've got somebody at the station that tells us, "Yeah, he's worked there for umpteen years, and there's never been EAS equipment there." <laughs> we're liable to propose it at eight thousand, but then we're liable to double it, saying, you know, the egregiousness of mm -hmm. the fact that you've never had EAS equipment at this station. And so, fines can can vary like that. Uh, depending upon the circumstances and just how serious we think the, the violation may or may not be. Before you get the information about the monitor sources, do you State plan. Okay. Yeah. It's whatever. The yeah. commission doesn't set them. We simply defer to the state plans, and that's in the rules that you monitor. I've got a file of pictures on here. Do you think you can get to it? Yeah. Oh, see, uh, are they still running the, uh, by remote control, the uh, monitor section at Kingsville? Yes. You know, they used to pick up a lot of over-mod things. And stuff. They must be busy, too. Now the FCC is going to be in our, our computer system. <laughs> How do you know they aren't already? <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that, too. That's a dual, dual side of the place. Steve, are you still having to chase down a lot of 5 gig interference? Somewhat, yes, yes. We're, in fact, we have a current case open on that. You'll double click on the one that says super virus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How is the pirate business these days in the FCC band? Is oh, it's still running. 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 Uh, Fortunately, we don't currently have any Houston that have been reported to me. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's go to BVAR pictures. I think that's probably got them in order. Um, is that it? Yeah, yeah. Double click on that one, and we'll just toggle on. Go down through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of what we do is mundane. Yeah. Driving by, y'all wouldn't have noticed this. Yeah, yeah. I noticed it right away. <laughs> Anybody tell me what's wrong with this picture? Yeah, the beacon's not on top. The beacon's yeah. not on top. <laughs> Next picture. <laughs> no birds on the top. <laughs> So I had them move it. Yeah. Yeah. And next. Yeah. Same thing here. I wasn't too concerned about the red one, but the, the strobe was definitely not on top. Okay. Yeah. So I had them move. Again, we had them move it. Yeah. Kind of, it's routine stuff y'all probably don't think about, but you know we have to be aware of. Next picture. This is the FCC registration number for a tower. Yeah. This one's actually posted on the building door, but you can't see it because I cut it off the picture and on the gate. Um, the gate only happens to be 20 feet from the door, so I don't know why they did it both ways, other than yeah. they were in the habit of doing it at their locations. Thanks. Got a call from a, uh, to do an inspection on this station. They were concerned that there was nobody at the studio. And sure enough, there was nobody at the studio, but they came in for me. And so I was running my usual inspection, and we couldn't figure out why ZAS equipment wasn't working. Thanks. 
Uh, next. There's his hip. Up next. There's his, his system. We could never get, and, and between the two of us, neither one of us could get the equipment. Well, the engineer was new, so that, you know, that was his excuse. I don't know what my excuse was. We could never hear the stations he was monitoring. Yeah. Next. So we traced the uh, antenna line. <laughs> <laughs> it was never connected. The new engineer came in. He never worried about checking it out. And the previous engineer that built the station somehow never got the antenna connected. Next. Let's see what we got there. Oh. This is a common, more, a problem more common in West Texas than it is here. The bottom half of this beacon's been shot out. Yeah. Yeah. This typically happens at the end of October before no. opening of deer season. <laughs> Next. Again, you can't see it, but the top half of this yeah. quarter yeah. of that has been shot out. But I fixed them. Oh, Next. <laughs> and next. This is what this is what happened when Hurricane Rita came through. Took this little alien station off the air that we were in the process of issuing a fine to. After seeing these photographs, my boss decided they didn't need a fine after all. <laughs> they already got fined. <laughs> they were going to get their lighting problem fixed. Yeah. Looks like they got a pay issue too. <laughs> I can't remember from the b bark meeting. Was that paint that way or did the hurricane? Do no, that paint was that way. We were, we were issued a fine for lack of paint and for the. But it, uh, the two directional, uh, two antenna directional, this is the second tower. You can see the force of that hurricane. Go back up just a bit. This, this whole third leg is just missing. It's been completely ripped out. So was that Rita in Beaumont? Or in yeah, Beaumont? yeah, that was Rita in Beaumont. Uh, the station's actually over across the river, so it's actually an orange transmitter site. We're, we're checking out the fence here, um, although the, the, the tower was pretty much protected because of the weeds. You couldn't get to it. But <laughs> it was a weed fence. <laughs> but my, my partner here finally found out that, yeah, you could, because the fence was laid down on the ground, you could get close enough to actually reach out and touch it. So he was demonstrating that you could do that. And the tower, we had the tower station off the air at the time, so we were safe. <coughs> but the the, uh, the owner wanted to point out to us, he did have his gate locked. Not all problems at stations are FCC oriented. We issued this station in NAL for lack of paint. And we came back six months later, checked the paint, and sure enough, the paint was good. But... When I walked around to the transmitter house, the door was standing wide open. <laughs> now, my camera didn't capture it, and I should have gotten flashed and gotten closer. There are little streaks of water running down the front of this transmitter. Oh, oh. The roof was leaking. They weren't on the air very long after that. But uh, the roof was leaking, and there were water streaks running down the front of the transmitter. It was a water cool transmitter. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that. This is not my definition of a latched and locked fence. Oh. Next. Of course, the water right there doesn't help either, does it? Yeah. No. <laughs> God. That was, the, the previous one was its first tower. It's a four-tower array. This is number two. Next. Number three. Oh, jeez. <laughs> number four. Oh, man. Wow. Consistency. Yeah. And, well, he argued that, that he had a perimeter fence, and he did. <laughs> Uh, this is part of his perimeter <laughs> fence. There's the transmitter. <laughs> Plus, next. This is the vehicle entrance. Oh, yeah. Next. Long gate. This is the gate that belongs on the vehicle entrance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are dead vines from last year. Yeah. And he told me, oh, he, he's there once a week. This guy, yeah. Next. This guy's also there once a week. Oh, that, that, that gate was shut and locked, Mr. Lee. Oh, yeah. I said, and how often are you out there? Oh, I'm out there every week. Every Wednesday on the way home, I stop by there. Did he, said, he didn't put that in writing, did he? Why there's 18 <laughs> inches of grass growing through the fence, yeah. through the uh, gate, you within the it? open position? <laughs> well, he couldn't explain that. <laughs> it's fast growing it grass. Fast. <laughs> That's obviously the reason we worry about all this. This is straight down the bottom. This is a five kilowatt station. And that was just open. 
And there was homes and school nearby. This is also just <clears throat> photographs we take to show that there is no perimeter fence and you're straight open from the street. We didn't count this as a fence. <laughs> um, although he did have this little white sign, which I was curious about, so I walked on the back side. So if you were if you were careful enough to walk around the tower without touching it, it was going to alert you that it was high voltage. He had one of them invisible fences, like yeah, they like. Fence yeah, to keep the dogs away. Yeah, yeah. This is just another one where I could see straight off the street. This was a downpour. I was out taking pictures in the rain out the car window. But again, there's there's his transfer to site, no fence, no excuse of fence. How much of a fine did he want to get in here? Seven thousand. Yeah, that's because he, he, he probably would have paid more than that for the fence. <laughs> Well, that, that's it. We don't require anything heavy duty. I mean, we're not scurrying a military base here, you know. We just, <laughs> we're just trying to keep kids away. Next. Uh, <laughs> I refer to this as my hidden broadcast station. I knew the station was supposed to be at this address when I showed up there was a beauty parlor there. <laughs> so I called the guy that was on his way again. I said, are you sure I'm at the right place? Next. Then I stood back, I looked up on the roof, and sure enough, yeah, there's this uh, pseudo to transmitter link. So obviously I was at the right place. Next. So he showed up, he showed me to a back room in this beauty parlor. And sure enough, he's got broadcast equipment there. Next. 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 Of course, none of it was plugged in, but he's got it. He said they after they after they chose this as their main studio because they needed a main studio in the community. They realized that the the there was train between the transmitter and the studio and they couldn't make the link work. Which he had paint issues too. Oh my! Uh, <laughs> what paint? Well, you can distinguish between the rust and the white. The rust and the white. That's yeah, true. but you want a quarter mile away either. <laughs> <laughs> That's a secondary studio. It's a mobile studio. Okay, well, that's all the broadcast stuff. This is the ter terminal Doppler radar stuff we've been working on with the FAA. Uh, I saw this at the VBART meeting when Steve presented. Uh, would you guys like to, you know, spend whatever five more minutes or ten yeah. more minutes and have it? Because it's very interesting about it if you're in if sure. you're no RF. The FAA so. has built a number of these. Houston has two of them. They're going in major airports first. It's called a terminal Doppler weather radar, and it's the FAA's latest super duper radar. And it is. I mean, they can count birds in flight. It, it is really a precise piece of electronic engineering. Uh, they're monstrosities. They're absolutely huge. Um, they have one flaw, though. Little quarter-watt transmitters in 5 gigs can screw them all up. <laughs> and these are being used now by these wireless internet companies to provide wireless internet service. So they're popping up all over the place. And they're unlicensed. So they operate in the Part 15 band, and the FAA has been calling us numerous times, saying, huh, "We've got another bearing on the the radar in Houston. We need y'all to go out bearing line and find out where this five gig transmitter is and get it off the air." So we've been devoting a inordinate amount of our time to do this. This is what it does to the radar pattern. Is, is it, it, it just absolutely wipes it out in that direction and they get corrupted data that way. So it only affects a narrow portion. So they can give us a bearing line, a very narrow bearing line. They can say, okay, it is you know, 185 degrees from the radar. And they can give us a, generally approximately how far away from the radar they think the noise is coming from. So we go out and we chase these down. They're coming from these devices. These are called UNITS, which stands for Universal National 
information and infrastructure devices, which is the fancy name they gave these, these five gig transmitters, uh, two-way transmitters for broadband service. And they can be on uh, any, any number of buildings. Um, anyway, we had a task force here locally in Houston formed a couple of years ago, and we went with the FAA to look at their radars and how these things showed up on the radars and what we would see them on a spectrum analyzer. Because unfortunately, our cars don't DF at five gigs. So we have to have a handheld antenna and a spectrum analyzer. This is just us figuring out how to do these things. Then we went out on rooftops to figure out where these are coming from. Um, we're, we're using the latest uh, spectrum analyzer technology. This is an RF Hawk, which is Agilent's really, really nice unit. Wait a minute. Tektronics, really, really nice unit. Next. So we're using parabolic antennas and, and figuring out if the uni is radi radiating anywhere near the radar frequency. We have to take from the radar frequency and go 30 megs on either side of the radar to make sure we clear these devices out. These devices can slip anywhere from 5.2 to 5.8. That's just a shot somebody took from one building to the next in downtown. That's the Wells Fargo Tower. Isn't it? And how much of that is the units? I don't see any unis on this one. Uh, there's a couple yeah. here, other little ones. There's yeah. one there. Yeah. You see, our tower's missing from there now because we moved. Yeah. Of course, the views were great from these towers. <laughs> yeah, so we, we were all fascinated, you know, those of us who rarely get up to those kind of heights. We're enjoying the views. Next. Next. <laughs> Although some buildings were a little more difficult to get up on than others. This is out San Felipe. Uh, San Felipe Tower out that almost to uh, Beltway. Next. But the view, again, was just absolutely spectacular. This one scared a bunch of our agents because it has no parapet wall. Yeah. It's this little just something for you to trip over. <laughs> <laughs> Some guys were relaxing. Yeah, I see that. This is one of the FAA guys who just, yeah, this is great, no problem. I'll sit here and make a phone call to Washington. <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't all fun and games. We're trying desperately, to, he's, he's trying desperately to figure out what signal's coming from that antenna. And I'm trying to decide how long I'm going to wait before I tell him. <laughs> there is no signal coming from that antenna. <laughs> he was actually getting a signal. As we found out, it was it was being bounced from another transmitter off that antenna. But it wasn't coming from that. But it wasn't coming from that. I guarantee it wasn't coming from that antenna. I had a hold of the cable. It wasn't coming from that antenna. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all got to eat, right? <laughs> No, I did not eat there. Yeah. People think I photoshopped this. This is an actual place in Homa, Louisiana. Back one. This is an actual place in, in Homa, Louisiana called the Venetian Bar and Donut Shop. What, what, street, what street is that on? It's in Main Street, downtown. Oh, okay. I have to go buy that the next time I'm over there. I got Only place I know you can go in and get a whiskey sour and a sour cream donut. <laughs> <laughs> and a Bud Light to go with it. <laughs> Please use the door to the left. Please use the door to the right. <laughs> I figured it was going to take me walking all the way around the building before I could get in. <laughs> that was self-explanatory. <laughs> This was during our drought and heat wave. I was out in uh, south of San Antonio tracking down some interference, and I drove by this cow. He figured the only cool place to stand was up and under the pier in the water. So I had to stop and take a picture of him. We do run into unusual things. One of the nice things about this job is I never know where I'm going to be. It'd been funny if it would have been a dog house at the end of it. <laughs> I think I should go on all my pirate stuff. You guys interested in pirates? Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Go for it. Okay, we got time? Sure. Yeah. 
This is typically what we're looking for when we get a report of a pirate. This is the typical antenna they buy. These guys buy off the internet because the, most of the websites sell it. Just a standard uh, tuned ground plane for the FM broadcast band. Although sometimes they do a pretty good job of hiding them. Uh, the DF kept telling me it was there and I never could see it. Finally got to a spot where I did see it. Okay. This guy put it all the way behind his apartment. Um, this is just copper tubing he, in, he installed, but uh, it went into his window, so it was just a matter of counting windows and going to the front and saying, okay, it's coming out of this apartment. Some of them are pretty obvious. I don't think his neighbors were too happy with this guy in this neighborhood and put up this 40-foot mask behind his house. This guy actually, uh, actually has a TV tower that's 75 feet tall, so he's got a pretty good... Although I don't know who he's got to climb it, but it's got a pretty good range on that one. This also was one that was hidden, and I had to go all the way around it to look for it. I knew it was coming from somewhere in here, and I finally saw the little pole and the coax cable. So it's just a matter of getting in the right place. One more. Nope, you, you did too much. Go back one. One more. We're missing a photo in there. Next. Forward or backwards? Forward. Uh, Forward again. Uh, Missing a photo there. Anyway, he had a sign similar to this advertising what station it was and what frequency they were on. Just had to get on the right side of the building. But I don't know where that photograph went. Uh, there it is. There it is. Uh, so when I finally got on the right side of the transmitter, I figured out that, yeah, he was advertising. They told me he was advertising that it was on the air. He actually had a vehicle logoed up. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't surprise me. We actually, uh, when we initially took action against this station, um, and, and typically on a pirate broadcaster, the first thing we're going to do is send them a warning letter. Um, it, it basically says that, you know, hey, you're operating a station in violation of the rules, please shut it down. If they do that, then we pretty much will leave them alone. We're not interested in trying to get money from these guys. Most of these guys are, have no money. But if they keep broadcasting, then we'll go ahead and we'll get, uh, we'll let you a fine, and we'll get the Justice Department involved. Uh, but this guy, after we issued him his warning letter, actually got a local Houston Congress person involved. This was in Houston? Yeah. With, with letters. Um, basically saying what a good guy he was and you know we needed to this he was serving a wonderful purpose here to his community uh, Acres home and yeah, we, can't we should just ignore the fact that he's violating federal law <coughs> well yeah well we do on well, so many other issues so yeah. <laughs> anyway um, we got him off the air uh, yeah, now. then I've got others that this guy actually was passing out cigarette lighters. He printed up sticky logos on and stuck them, um, adhesive logos and stuck them on cigarette lighters and was passing them out in the neighborhood. He was proud of it. This guy was also advertising, uh, again here in Houston, <coughs> that he had an FM station on the air. and So he wasn't too hard to find. He stuck these signs on every telephone pole within two blocks of his business. Not that our, our DF didn't take us right to him, it did. <laughs> Some of them pretty brazen. Uh, oh, he's got fence he's got fence signage. There you go. Help him find it. He's got fence signage, that's right. <laughs> that's that's great. Right. I do offer some words of advice of anybody that's going to become a pirate broadcaster. <laughs> if you work in the industry, don't pump your park your company car out front. Yeah. Of, your, of your pirate broadcast station. Yeah, yeah. Next. He was doing a story on it. <laughs> and the second thing is, if you're that good that you can turn an old television exciter yeah. into an FM broadcast station, get yourself a real dummy load and lose the light. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got a nice bird meter there. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> And my last
last bit of advice for this guy was get the right slug. This is a 400 to 1,000 meg slug. <laughs> we did check it with our watt meter. He was putting out right at 25 watts. So we do know that that was correct. This is one of those unusual Austin ones we have where you're a little concerned to, to uh, when you run up to the station, you, you figure out which house it is, but it was right on the fence line in the back of the house, so. Because yeah. it had deer everywhere guarding the station. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a zoo. We run the gamut on, on pirate broadcasters to those that are real serious to those just fly by the night college guys who decide, hey, this sounds like a fun thing to do. And they order a transmitter off the internet and they're done with it once we show up. This was actually a church here, here in South Houston. Um, had a rather professional type setup. Uh, real nice microphones here for on, on their interviews. Um, nice, well, inexpensive, but a nice board. It, it, it did the job for them for all their conditions and a real cheap transmitter. <laughs> yeah, these transmitters are so cheap, they warn you that you've got to make sure your antenna is connected before you plug it in or it'll burn up the final. This is a real common transmitter available online that we run into. It's professional stereo, FM stereo transmitter. Professional. Yeah. <laughs> This guy had a pretty good setup at his business. This was again a business. He had his little uh, MP3 player in a loop. So he recorded the loop and he just played it over and over again advertising his business. All right. <laughs> this was one that I was a little concerned about, but fortunately I had police officers with me when I went in because the property was not in great shape. Found the transmitter connected to his computer uh, transmitting. But what I was more concerned about was he had a manifesto here written out on paper towel rolls. <laughs> uh, I guess he ran out of regular paper. Uh, uh. As I said, not all these guys are cheap. This is a professional office building in Austin. Uh, real nice uh, ground plane <laughs> antenna. <laughs> top. And he actually had a 40 watt amplifier hooked into the to the uh, Five watt transmitter boosted up to forty. A oh, one hundred point one. Yes. Right. I'll try to keep names out of this. In case any, any guys know this guy? This guy's a former broadcaster. Uh oh. Um, this is over in Houston. We'll just say that. Um, I knew he was serious when he took off his satellite dish receiver to attach his power broadcast transmitter antenna. But that's his studio. He was serious. Told me he had about seventy-eight thousand dollars invested in it. I guess he didn't work for one hundred four. <laughs> Not anymore. All right, we're gonna finish up with this guy. Uh, keep going. He was using a standard transmitter antenna that I told you about. And we did all the documentation we needed. For any of you amateur radio operators in here, this guy's an extra class. <laughs> we showed up at noon at his house. He was still in his pajamas. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we need this for the, the website. <laughs> so we never know what we're going to run into when we're out there. We deal with, with guys that are cordial. <laughs> Guys that are really into it and get serious when we show up, telling them they have to go off the air. And guys, either often we show up with and they're not the slippers for that for that very reason. <laughs> this guy was quite uh, quite docile when we showed up. Fact, he kind so of I guess the, the, the lesson there is that anybody can pass the amateur extra. Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that it? <laughs> well, the lesson okay. we took from it is anybody can be a pirate station operator. Yeah, well, I don't know <laughs> that. An amateur extra. <laughs> Can you shut that down? Do we have any more questions? Anybody else? All right. <laughs>
Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, I've got a handful of business cards. If anybody who doesn't have a card for me already would like to grab one, I brought them. So. And Pastor Lord, anybody that did not show up today, everybody in this room gets a uh, free pass for 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> You're on your own. Uh, there any, uh, good this was to bring you for the chapter? Do I hear a motion that we bring the activities to a close? Yeah. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Aye. See you next month. He can do it. Uh, it? Uh, Already uh, comes, though. Well, next time. Next time? Yeah, big time.